Welcome into Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you are having fantastic Mondays wherever across the country you may find yourself. We have got much to get to. Six big stories. Let me give you the rundown automatically off the jump here. The college football playoff picture. Ohio State crushes Michigan. Baker Mayfield dunks on Hugh Jackson. Titans-Texans Monday Night Football tonight. Uh, the Bortles benched by the Jags. Is this the end for him in Jacksonville? Cody Kessler takes over. And should the University of Tennessee or Auburn or some other school that needs an offensive coordinator go out and hire Hugh Freeze? We have got a lot to get to. Let's go to the playoff picture. There are six teams right now alive for the college football playoff. I am going to do a better job now breaking down the entire college football playoff picture than probably anyone you're going to hear anywhere. First of all, Alabama is in the playoff unless Tua gets hurt against Georgia. Alabama, I believe when the playoff comes out on Tuesday will have four, the final final regular season rankings will have four top 25 wins. That's more top 25 wins than anybody else in college football will have. All of the arguments about Alabama not playing a tough tough enough schedule, all of that is stupidity. We're talking about uh, 22 or more. That's the number of points that Alabama has beaten every opponent by. We're talking about a level of dominance we haven't seen in college football before going back a long, long way. That includes such illustrious teams as 95 Nebraska, closer games. 2001 Miami, closer games. 2002 Miami, the team that got the late pass interference called on them. 2004 USC. 2005 USC, the one that lost to Texas. Every team in the modern history that I have looked back on that was in any way in the Alabama universe has not been as dominant as Alabama against a schedule that is tougher than virtually anybody else who is playing in the college football uh, championship. Uh, So, unless we end up with a McKenzie Milton-like injury, Alabama has punched their ticket there in the playoffs. So, too, is Notre Dame. Notre Dame, you may not like it that they're not playing a conference championship game. You may think that they're being treated unfairly. 12-0, they are in the college football playoff. That leaves two spots. Who are going to get those spots? There are four candidates to get those final two spots. All right? Clemson. Clemson is a 24-ish point favorite over Pittsburgh. I believe Clemson will beat Pittsburgh. They will be in the playoff at 13-0. I would say this about Clemson in general. Okay? Let me say this. I'm not as big of a believer in Clemson as many people want to be because I think the the, uh, ACC is a disaster, disaster this year. Look at what happened in the big ACC versus SEC conversations. We always have these rivalry games, right? Georgia goes out, gets up 45-7 on Georgia Tech. Pretty big beatdown Georgia put on. Kentucky beats Louisville 56-10. And Florida beats Florida State 41-14. South Carolina goes on the road at the Gamecocks and posts 35 points against this vaunted Clemson defense They went up and down the field on them. They had a lot of success, okay? I'm not as convinced that Clemson is as good as many people seem to believe they are. I think if they lose to Pittsburgh, Clemson wouldn't make the playoff. So Clemson has to win. We have two teams that are in, Alabama, Notre Dame. Clemson, if they finish and go 13-0, and then the battle becomes who among Georgia, Oklahoma, and uh, Ohio State will get the fourth playoff spot. That's assuming that Clemson wins. That's assuming that Notre Dame wins. How would you actually break it down? Here's what needs to happen. If Georgia beats Alabama, right now they are a 13-point underdog in the SEC title game down in Atlanta this weekend. I'll be there. If Georgia beats Alabama, they're in the playoff. They would probably join Clemson. They would probably join Notre Dame. That's your playoff. It doesn't matter what Oklahoma does. It doesn't matter what Ohio State does. Great stat for you here that I clipped off that I want to read to you that I think deserves more attention than it is receiving. It is pretty wild. Georgia has wins over seven teams with winning records this year. Ohio State and Oklahoma have six wins over 
teams with winning records combined. If you want to talk about Georgia's resume, listen to that one more time. Georgia already has seven wins over teams with winning records this year. Oklahoma and Ohio State combined have six wins over teams with winning records so far this year. Georgia would 100% be in and Alabama would remain in. Okay, so if Georgia loses to Alabama, who gets in between Oklahoma and Ohio State as the number four playoff team? I think it's Oklahoma. I think when you look at the totality of Oklahoma's resume, they will have lost to Texas, come back and erased that loss while only losing by three points. I think it rises above the resume that Ohio State will post if they beat Northwestern. So, Oklahoma, if they win and Georgia loses, they are in. If Georgia and Oklahoma lose, then Ohio State is in. If Ohio State and Oklahoma both lose, then Georgia would get in as the top two loss team in all of college football. UCF won't be considered because of the awful McKenzie Milton injury. Barring a Tua-like injury, such like uh, Alex Smith or McKenzie Milton has gotten, Alabama is in no matter what happens in the SEC title game. So I believe we have two teams that have already punched their ticket, Alabama 12-0 and 12-0 Notre Dame. I believe that if uh, if Georgia wins, they're in. I believe that if Clemson wins, they're in. I think the other two teams in order are Oklahoma and Ohio State. If Oklahoma, Ohio State, and Georgia all lose, then I think Georgia would get in as the fourth playoff team with an 11-2 record. Boom! That's the entire college football playoff picture. I don't even think there are any hypotheticals you guys can ask Those are the six teams that are alive for four playoff spots. Now, having said that, what do I wish would happen? If Oklahoma and Ohio State finished both 12-1, and here's what I wish we could have, guys. I wish we could have a playoff game, a play-in game between Oklahoma and Ohio State on pay-per-view for charity on the Wildfires and the Hurricanes. Every dollar goes to charity Oklahoma and Ohio State strap it up a week after the conference championship games. They play a play-in game head-to-head, neutral field, indoors, perfect uh, perfect situation, maybe down at Jerry World, and allow the winner of that game to advance to the playoff as the four seed in a play-in game. Every dollar goes to charity. They put it on pay-per-view. It actually works, unlike the Tiger and Phil uh, charity match. Every dollar that's raised goes to the wildfire relief in California and the massive hurricane that we just had down on the Panhandle in Florida where there remains a massive need for help down there. I just came from the Panhandle. That would be perfect. That would be the perfect situation beyond a shadow of a doubt. I don't think we're going to get that unfortunately. And so as a result, I believe that it will be Oklahoma in over Ohio State, both of those teams in line behind Georgia. That's the playoff. That's the playoff. That is where we are headed. Everyone should be able to break that down. Uh, Okay, any questions at all about the playoff uh, situation? Any questions at all? Let me know what you think and I will answer any questions. But I believe I have answered literally the entire playoff picture in the first 10 minutes of this show run through everything for you. All right, here is my second statement. I was wrong. You hear me say it rarely, but when I am wrong, I completely own it. I was wrong in buying in to the great media hype machine that was the Michigan defense. The Michigan defense was slow, It was ill-suited for a talented offense or a quarterback who could throw the ball all over the field. We allowed ourselves to be seduced by the crap schedule that Michigan played all season long. They are likely to finish with only one top 25 win over Penn State and it was the worst game that Penn State played all year. Jim Harbaugh remains the most overrated coach in the history of college football. And as a result... There was a beatdown delivered 
by Ohio State to Michigan. I apologize to Buckeye fans for betting on Michigan. I apologize to everyone out there for saying that I thought Jim Harbaugh was ready to maintain and claim the, 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 the absolute apex of the Big Ten. Michigan, they ain't there. And there's no excuses anymore for Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. For a long time, it was wait for Harbaugh to get his players. He was left a mess by Brady Hoke. Then it was, well, Jim Harbaugh doesn't have a quarterback. The defense is flawless. If we just had a quarterback, we would be able to run out there and beat anybody. And then you know what happened? They got a quarterback. They took him from down at Ole Miss. They won 11 games in a 10 games in a row, whatever the heck it was. They rolled into Ann Arbor as a favorite, and Urban Meyer delivered a beatdown of epic proportions. We know Urban Meyer is not going to call authorities on the beatdown he delivered because that's not what he does. But he maybe should have because Michigan got their ass smacked around all over that field. It was not remotely close. It was amazing how Urban Meyer had no ill effects health-wise on the sideline the whole game. I don't know about you, but when Urban Meyer's team is losing or things are not going well, he looks like he is on the edge of death. He looks like at any moment he is going to collapse and he is going to die. When his team is playing well, he doesn't have any health concerns at all. I don't know about you, definitely looks a little bit Hollywood-like, definitely looks like he's playing to the cameras so everybody will know in what pain he is in, but the only pain he delivered on Saturday came from his team beating the crap out of Michigan. I barely even saw Urban Meyer lean over. I saw very few agony-ridden faces. This was a seismic beatdown. Look, sometimes you lose games. Sometimes the better team can even lose a game. When you hang your hat on your defense and you give up 62 points like Michigan did, that's not just a loss. That's a culture-redefining beatdown the likes of which we have never seen in a game like this. I don't even believe that Michigan should be able to call Ohio State rivals right now. I'll say it. I do not believe that Tennessee should be able to call uh, Alabama rivals. When you get your ass kicked every year and you have no chance to win, now think about this for a minute. In the last 15 years, Ohio State is 14-1 and against Michigan. Do you know the only win that Michigan has in the last 15 years? It's over Luke Fickle by six points in Ann Arbor. In the last 15 years, Michigan has only beaten Ohio State one time, 40-34, to and they did it against an interim coach. That's the only win Michigan has over Ohio State. That's not a rivalry. Is Maryland-Michigan a rivalry? No. It's just a game that gets played. Maryland has beaten Michigan one time in the last eight years. We would never say, oh, I love that Terrapin and that Wolverine rivalry. Michigan-Ohio State is not a rivalry. It's not the game. It's just a game. Because Ohio State owns Michigan right now and there's nothing that Michigan can do about it. And Jim Harbaugh is not close to winning a championship because... He got exposed by Ohio State, but if he had not gotten exposed by Ohio State, he would have gotten exposed by Alabama, by Clemson, by Oklahoma, by Georgia. All four of those teams have just as good of offenses as Ohio State does, and they would have done to, uh, to Michigan just what Ohio State did. Michigan is not close to championship caliber. Jim Harbaugh's team is slow. They were flat-footed. They had absolutely no ability to compete when it came to the athletes that Ohio State trotted out on the field. It reminded me back in the day of how slow the Big Ten used to be compared to the SEC. And that is my statement. I take back all my criticism of Ohio State related to their performance this year. When you hang 62 on Michigan in a game where you are the underdog and you beat their ass as soundly as you did, I have to rescind all my criticism. You won the Big Ten East. Jim Harbaugh 0-4 against Urban Meyer. 
two for six overall in his big games. And the only real rival that Michigan has right now is Michigan State because occasionally you beat Michigan State. You do not beat Ohio State. You can't call it a rivalry until you actually beat them. You don't get to sit around and argue, well, back in the 90s, we were really good. Or back in the 1980s. Sooner or later, if you want to call a game a rivalry, your side has to win. Beating Luke Fickle once in the last 15 years when he was an interim by six points does not a rivalry make it. Okay? That is my analysis of Michigan against Ohio State. How about Baker Mayfield? I'm slowly, I got to admit to you, falling in love with how outspoken Baker Mayfield is. I think Hugh Jackson is a fraud. Hugh Jackson got fired as a head coach and then took another job to coach against the team that used to be his. I can't, you guys may be able to remember this. Can you remember a head coach getting fired and then going to work in the same season for the team that fired him? I've never seen anything like this. I have never seen anything like this in college football, in the NFL, in the NBA, in Major League Baseball, anywhere. Hugh Jackson has the right to make a living. He can sit out for eight more games and then come back when he gets the opportunity to come back as a coach. This kind of turncoat move is unprecedented in sports and I love that the Cleveland Browns dunked all over Hugh Jackson who is a fraudulent coach. This is a great stat for you. Since Hugh Jackson was fired, Baker Mayfield is only behind Drew Brees in best quarterback in the NFL overall rating. I want to repeat that because it's an amazing stat. Since Hugh Jackson has been fired, Baker Mayfield has been the second best quarterback in the NFL. And in addition to the fact that Hugh Jackson could not win and went on his apology tour where he blamed everyone else for his failings, he then tried to coach against his own team Theoretically, a team he has broken down and knows better than any other team. And they came out and kicked his ass as bad as Ohio State kicked Michigan's ass. Hugh Jackson should never be a head coach in the NFL again. Also, I applaud all of the Cleveland Browns for dunking all over him. How about my man picking off an interception and handing it to his former head coach on the sideline? That should relegate Hugh Jackson to coaching high school football. I don't know how you come back for that. You are coaching on the sideline. Your man, I think it was Demetrius Randall, was that who it was? Picks off an interception and then he runs over to the sideline and hands you the intercepted ball, returning it to you. That is one of the lowest things I have ever seen done to a head coach in my life. If this were real life and you talked about dunking on somebody, Hugh Jackson would have been dunked on so bad he would have died. He'd have to leave coaching. He should get relegated all the way back to high school. Once you come and coach against the team that fires you and they pick off a ball right in front of you and they walk over and hand you the football, your career should be over. That's basically just letting you know you've been red slipped, pink slipped, whatever you want to call it. You are done in coaching for the rest of your days. That team hated Hugh Jackson. I don't blame them for hating him. He looks like and coaches like a guy who is a loser and the Cleveland Browns treated him as such and beat his ass all over the field. They even handed him the balls they were intercepting from Andy Dalton. Woo! That is a beatdown of epic proportions. I absolutely loved it. And by the way, I'm sorry Bengals fans. How in the world is Marvin Lewis still employed? Does anybody out there in America understand how Marvin Lewis is still employed. Remember when everybody was going after Jason Garrett and Stephen A. Smith got up on his precipice and he said, how is Jason Garrett still employed? This is an example of what black people talk about when they talk about white people getting unfair uh, unfair, uh, advantages. What about Marvin Lewis? The dude has never won a playoff game and he's been coaching the Bengals since 1943. I don't know how it's possible. They went away for World War II. They fought World War II, beat the Nazis, and then the Bengals came back to Cincinnati and Marvin Lewis has been coaching there ever since. It's a one-man coaching job. It's like he owns the team. 
at least Jerry Jones is the GM. It's like Marvin Lewis owns the team and just named himself the champ. He's like, remember when you were a kid and there was only one guy who might have the ball in the neighborhood to play with and the guy who had the ball got to make the rules? That must be what goes on at the Bengals facility. I don't get it. There's only one football. Well, that guy gets to make the rules. He says it's one hand touch. I want to play two hand touch. How about beer pong? When you are playing beer pong, the house where the beer pong resides, beer pong table resides, gets to have the rules, right? Can you blow it out of the cup? Can you knock it away? Can you bounce? All of those rules, house rules. Marvin Lewis has house ruled the NFL. It's like the regular rules of coaching in the NFL don't apply to Marvin Lewis. If Marvin Lewis was white, there would be like eight beat reporters at ESPN covering Marvin Lewis every day they would come on television and they would say, the only reason Marvin Lewis is still employed is because he's a white guy and this is an example of white privilege. Marvin Lewis is a black dude and it's like everybody's forgotten that he gets to keep coaching. I don't understand it. The rules of basic society do not apply when it comes to Marvin Lewis. He just loses and loses badly every year and his team's undisciplined. And every year they trot out the ginger rocket, Andy Dalton, and Bengals fans try to get excited when they start off the year 3-1. and one, And they're like, this is our year. We're going to pay Andy Dalton $20 million. He's going to take us to the Super Bowl. And then what happens? Like a China doll, he breaks. And so does the Cincinnati Bengals season. I can't imagine being a Bengals fan. I feel bad for you, son. I apologize to all of you who have to live with this. They need in Cincinnati someone like me. Because if I lived in Cincinnati and I was a Bengals fan there is a 0% chance that Marvin Lewis would still be the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. People come after me all the time. I said, Clay, you give way too many opinions. You're way too aggressive. I will tell you right now, if I had been born in Cincinnati, there is a 0% chance. Can you imagine a life where Clay Travis is a huge Buckeye fan and also where I'm a huge Bengals fan? There is a 0% chance that Marvin Lewis would still be employed. All this tells me that no member of the media in the entire Cincinnati area has a functional penis because or testes that have descended because if they had, they would stand up to the Cincinnati Bengals and say to Mike Brown, you, sir, are indefensible. There is no way Marvin Lewis can remain the head coach and you certainly can't go hire Hugh Jackson and bring him in. I'm just telling you, it's unbelievable. Titans-Texans tonight. Monday Night Football. Speaking of the team that I root for, Titans have to win. Titans are not going to get a wild card spot. I love the way the Colts are playing. I love everything about the performance of Andrew Luck and the Titans and Marcus Mariota. If they are going to get a playoff berth, have to win the AFC South. How do you win the AFC South? You beat the Houston Texans in Houston like you beat them earlier this year in Nashville even when you didn't have Marcus Mariota. You have to go beat them. Demarius Thomas has been a bust. Will Fuller hasn't been replaced. Demarius Thomas, by the way, probably going to have 900 yards receiving lined up against Malcolm Butler on uh, tonight. But this is a game the Titans have to win. Titans win, tosses it into a three-way race in the AFC South. 6-5 and five Indianapolis Colts, 6-5 and five Tennessee Titans, 7-4 and four Houston Texans. Texans win, they get to 8-3. and three. They can coast the rest of the way, I honestly believe this, to winning the division title. And the Titans would have to win out the rest of the way in order to contend for a wildcard berth because you know that Philip Rivers, who has found the fountain of youth alongside of Drew Brees, that those guys uh, are going to play at a high level. Philip Rivers completed 25 straight passes. His team is 8-3. and three. They're going to get one of the wild card berths. So I'm on the Titans plus four tonight. I am on the uh, Titans plus four. I'm also on the under in this game. I think it's low scoring. I think it's ugly. I think it is brutal. And I think one team wins by three points. I don't know which team it's going to be. I hope it's going to be the Titans. I think it'll look a lot like the game that we saw back in September. Blake Bortles, speaking of the AFC South, has been benched. Where are my Blake Bortles supporters? Every moment that Blake Bortles has been in the NFL, every time I mention him, I think Blake Bortles must have like 50 burner accounts. All these Jacksonville Jaguar fans hop in my mentions and they defend Blake Bortles to the end of the earth. He has now been benched for Cody Kessler. Y'all, Cody Kessler. Cody Kessler, if you don't remember, is like the 698th best quarterback to play football for Southern Cal since 2004. All right? I don't even know how Cody Kessler is still in the NFL 
it speaks to how many good quarterbacks they've had at Southern Cal that the 698th best quarterback since 2004 who has played for the Southern California Trojans is now still in the NFL and he's taken over for Blake Bortles. But I will say this about the Jags. When your best running back gets in a legit fist fight during the game, Leonard Fournette, when your quarterback continues to be defended by pointing out that he's a good runner, and when your defensive players like Jalen Ramsey got dunked on by, uh, by I can't even say this guy's name. What's his name? Justin Allen? I, I, I wanted to say Jason Aldean. This guy is awful. All right, This guy is Josh Allen is awful beyond a shadow of a doubt. The dude has major issues with throwing the football, right? He can drop back and throw it like 100 miles an hour, but he has no idea where it's going. Only the Buffalo Bills and a few other teams could fall in love to such an extent with a guy with a big, strong arm that they don't even notice he has no idea where it's going. Josh Allen, when he throws the football, reminds me of my kid when he pees and he really has to pee bad. You ever hold up a kid when he has to go pee? And the kid has to pee so bad that it's like a fire hose going off and you're like hitting the wall and you hit the side of the, the side of the of the, the stall and there's just pee spraying everywhere and it's like a pee murder scene when you leave you're like man that was a disaster. Every now and then when my kid has to go to the bathroom really bad, I hold him up, it's like a fire hose and he's just like spraying in every different direction. That's what Josh Allen's like throwing the football. And he just beat the Jacksonville Jaguars and outplayed Blake Bortles who you just gave $54 million to. I don't know. Sometimes good decisions are made. Oftentimes bad decisions, it seems like to me, are made. Josh Allen not only beat the Jags, he stepped right up and dunked on Jalen Ramsey, who talked trash about how bad Josh Allen was, and then his team got beat in Buffalo by him. I don't even know what to say. I can't even think of the equivalent for me as what happened to Jalen Ramsey. That would be like me going out and saying Jamel Hill was uh, was totally overrated in what she does at ESPN, and then she signed a $100 million contract, bought my radio company, bought OutKick, and fired me. That's basically what Josh Allen did. She could, or maybe, maybe that's what Marvin Lewis is doing every day of the week. I don't know how you come back from that if you're Jalen Ramsey either. He and Hugh Freeze should have to go live on a deserted island for a while, just crack coconuts, sit there, watch the sun rise and fall into the ocean. Uh, finally. Hugh Freeze, all right? Hugh Freeze is out there. I don't like it when people overthink things. The University of Tennessee was awful at offense last year. They were atrocious beyond all measure. Hugh Freeze would take the Tennessee offensive coordinator job. He would come in and immediately he could become the head coach of the offense Jeremy Pruitt can handle the defense. You've got a killer tandem then. As good of a coaching staff on the offensive and defensive sides of the ball as would exist in the SEC. Don't overthink this. Pick up the phone. Call Hugh Freeze. I can give you his number if you need to. University of Tennessee officials. Get this deal done. Bring him to Knoxville. Let him redeem himself as the head offensive coach of Tennessee. Fix that offense Find out if Garantano is the answer or not. It's not complicated. I don't like when people overthink things. Hire talented people. Let them do the job. Jeremy Pruitt's very talented on the defensive side of the ball. I'm very confident going forward that Tennessee is going to be great on the defensive side of the ball as Jeremy Pruitt's recruits all arrive. We know that Hugh Freeze is incredible on the offensive side of the ball. I don't think it's a difficult decision to make at all. Don't overthink things. When you have got a home run, take the home run. When somebody hangs a curveball in front of you and you have a huge opportunity to make your team better, don't overthink it. Go get the best offensive coordinator available in college football, and that is Hugh Freeze. I am Clay Travis. Kisses, boys and girls. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP. Uh, go buy my book. If you want an autographed copy, they're $50 on outkick.com. You'll get them all before Christmas. If you want to buy multiple copies, you can email us. We'll give you a reduced rate if you want to buy like 10 and give 10 different signed copies to all your friends and family. What better angle could you give than this guy in the back? How about this guy in the back? Look at that picture. If your wife won't sleep with you, 
And it's Christmas season. You know what you do? You buy the book. You open it up. And you say, look at this guy's picture. Look at this guy's picture in the dust jacket. I know you're aroused now. Let's go to it. My name is Clay Travis. This is Outkick, the show. Kisses, boys and girls. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP. This is... As always, I'll keep the show. I'll be live here in a few minutes on FS1, giving you more gambling picks. We've been on a roll. I'll talk to you soon. Kisses from me to you. Happy holidays.